of man's existence is an eternal space. A space that can only be filled by one who is eternal in nature. Life is a never-ending pursuit of rest. It never ends. The devil does not mind that we have been swept and cleansed and garnished as long as we're not filled, as long as we remain empty. Get back up and get filled up Home. I invite you to take your Bible and open with me to the book of Matthew. I hope you brought your Bible. I hope you brought a spiritual appetite as we feast upon the bread of life today. The message of this hour is entitled, The Peril of Emptiness. The Peril of Emptiness. Jesus spoke these words in Matthew chapter 12. We're going to begin in verse 43. Matthew 12 and verse 43. And when you get there and if you're ready to study the Bible, would you let me know by saying amen? amen. It's a parable that Jesus said. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walks through dry places seeking rest, and finds none. Then he says, now here Jesus is about to quote the devil himself. Then he says, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it, the house that had been cleansed from the devil. He findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Empty. Swept and garnish. Now, friends, listen. This word garnish is a very interesting word. In the Greek, the word garnish is the word kosmeo. What word is that? And that Greek word kosmeo is, is the word by which we get the English word cosmetics. In other words, the condition of this house that had been cleansed from the devil, it was put in order, it was swept, and it was garnished, it was embellished, it was covered up with cosmetics to cover up the insecurities and the emptiness within. And so this demon comes back to the house that is empty and swept and garnished, put together. And in verse 45 it says, then he goes, notice friends, he does not enter into the man when he comes back. He goes to see the condition, but then the Bible says that he goes and takes with himself seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. Even so, Jesus makes the application. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. This is a very solemn parable, friends. In this parable, Jesus is giving to us both an urgent invitation as well as a very serious and solemn warning. The primary point of the parable is that it is not enough for us to be emptied of evil because that was the condition of the house. He was emptied of evil. The demon was cast out of this man. And so the point is that it's not enough for us to be emptied of evil. We must be filled in order to be fulfilled. We must be saturated with the Spirit in order to be satisfied with salvation. That's the point of the parable, friends. It is a very potent point. You see, my brothers and my sisters, Christianity is not about being emptied of wrong. It's rather about being filled with what is right with the righteousness of Christ. It's been a few years now since I, as well as a bunch of other missionaries, got on board a plane that was heading to the Hindu and Muslim-saturated land of India. We were there a few years ago. 
And we were there to do a week of revival at one of our Adventist colleges there. It was a college, it was also a high school and an elementary school at the same time. And so we'd speak to everyone in the morning, and then the elementary students in the afternoon, and then the college and high school in the evening. And we're there for a week, and, and we're speaking to hundreds and hundreds of young people, many of them coming from Hindu and Muslim backgrounds. They were there going to school, and it was a powerful week of prayer. And at the end of that week, over 40 of those uh, young people were, were baptized, many of them uh, coming from Hindu and Muslim backgrounds. It was wonderful. God truly blessed. Renanda was with me on that trip as well. We had a great time together. Now, after the week of revival was finished, we had just a few days to go and, 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 and go sightseeing and be a tourist. By the way, that's one, of the, that's one of the benefits. That's one of the perks of preaching the gospel in all the world. You, actually go, you can actually go and see all the world. And so when I was preparing for the trip to India, I had a list of things that I wanted to do when I was there. Of course, we were there on God's errands to preach. That's the primary purpose of the trip. But then after that, I, I, there were some things I wanted to do in that country. I wanted to ride a camel, and I'm thankful that we got the chance to ride a camel. It was pretty fun. I also wanted to see a snake charmer, but we didn't get to do that. He was out for the day. Uh, and I also wanted to eat fine Indian cuisine. And let me tell you, friends, they, the place we were staying at, uh, they actually hired four cooks, four chefs, and their main job was to cook for us every single day, morning, afternoon, and evening, and every single meal was different. It was an amazing experience, and so we got to do that, but on the top of the list, the very most important thing I wanted to do when I was there is I wanted to go and visit my palace, <laughs> the Taj Mahal. It is called one of the seven wonders of the world. It's the great symbol of love in India. The Taj Mahal, it means the crown palace. And it was the Indian emperor, Shah Jahan, that actually built this mausoleum as a monument of love for his third wife that he loved so much. Now, I can't help but imagine how his first two wives felt about that. Because they didn't get no palace, let me tell you. But he loved his third wife so much that he built this massive building, the Taj Mahal, the crown palace, and her name, the third wife, her name was uh, Mumtaz Mahal, which means beloved ornament of the palace. And so the Taj is the crown, and she was the ornament in the crown. And this beautiful mausoleum, the Taj, actually what happened was she passed away after giving birth to their 13th child. And the Taj Mahal was to be her final resting place, as well as the resting place of the king who loved her so much. And so with great eagerness and anticipation, I, I was excited to go see my palace, the, 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 the Taj Mahal. It's, it's called one of the seven wonders of the world. It's the place that my beloved mother named me after. When she was pregnant with me, she saw a poster of the Taj Mahal. And she looked at that poster she said, wow, that sounds nice. And so here I am today. <laughs> and when I first saw it, the very first moment my eyes laid on that building, I was taken back by its beauty. Everything was magnificent and beautiful and glorious. It was easy on the eyes. Any of you ever been to the Taj Mahal before? Am I the only one? All right, we'll go together next time. Even I want to go back. But this mausoleum, let me, let me just describe it, see if you can picture it in your mind. It's made primarily of translucent white marble that was shipped all over Asia to, the, to India, causing the, the, the beautiful edifice to stand up and stand out amongst the smoke and smog-filled atmosphere of Agra there in India. When you enter into the outer gate, the first thing you see in the, in the court is you see a long rectangular pool of water seeming to prostrate itself before the Taj, reflecting its glory and beauty. There are also intricate designs of orchids and roses and lilies and, 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 that, that are made of jasper and jade and crystal and sapphire and over 28 precious and semi-precious stones that are inlaid in the marble walls. The building itself is surrounded by lush green gardens and shady trees and everything is perfectly symmetrical. And the size and the shapes of the buildings, everything, even down to the designs on the walls. And the history books tell us that it took over 1,000 transporting elephants to bring the material uh, and it also took 
over 20,000 uh, laborers and sculptors and calligraphers and inlayers and stone cutters, 20,000 of them, it took them 20 years to actually finish this building. No wonder why it's called the Crown Palace. No wonder why they say it's one of the seven wonders of the world. And so when I saw it, after my initial amazement settled down, I was hit and overwhelmed by a powerful object lesson. You see, friends, every day, the Taj is swept clean by the janitors in order to prepare for the, the thousands of visit, visitors that come every day. This beautiful building is swept clean. It is garnished with beautiful pictures of roses and lilies and, and all kinds of different colors of the different precious stones inlaid in the marble. It's beautiful. It's appealing to the eyes. In fact, before you can even enter the building, you have to put disposable socks over your shoes so that you don't bring your dirt and your filth in that building. It's garnished, it's beautiful, it's swept, it's captivating to the eyes, but this building, when I went inside the building, it was filled with emptiness. Filled with emptiness. You see, there's no practical purpose for the building. There were no chairs or benches for people to sit down and rest. There were no rooms in the building that people actually lived in. It was filled with a profound emptiness. The only thing that was in the building were the dry, dead bones of the queen and the king. Basically, it's a glorified grave. That's what it is. It's swept. It's cleansed. It's garnished but it's empty, empty. And you know, many times I, when I hear my name called, I'm reminded of that powerful lesson that I learned from my visit to the Taj that day. The lesson that is simply this. It's not enough, friends, for us to be swept, cleansed, and garnished. We must be filled in order to be fulfilled. We must be saturated with the Spirit in order to be satisfied with salvation. And too many times, Christianity for us is just like the Taj Mahal. It looks so good on the outside. We're swept and we're cleansed. We're emptied of evil, but the reality is we're still empty. And there's a void in our religious experience. This was the point, friends, of the parable that Jesus is telling us today. In fact, if you read the context, Jesus tells this parable right after he freed a man that was possessed by demonic spirits. And so the point of this parable, it's basically given as an urgent invitation to the man that had just been swept clean of evil to go quickly and get filled with that which is good. In fact, read verse 22 with me. Notice Matthew 12 verse 22. The Bible says, And there was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. He could not see, he could not speak. But then the Bible says that Jesus healed him, insomuch that the blind and, uh, and, the, blind and the dumb both spoke and saw. You see, friends, whenever we come to Jesus, that's the condition we always come in. Possessed with the devil. That word possession means to, to take control of. Without Christ, we're at the mercy of the enemy, friends. There is no such thing as neutral ground. We're all servants and we all have masters. The question is, which master do you serve? Jesus said, you, no man can serve two masters. It's either one or the other. This morning as we sit here in church, it's either we're under the control of the Holy Spirit or under the control of an unclean spirit. You see, friends, when we first come to Jesus, we come bound by evil. We can't see clearly. We can't speak the things of God. But this man had an encounter with the divine exorcist, and as a result of encountering Jesus, Jesus set him free. The chains were broken, and he who could not see and could not speak was able to see clearly and speak the praises of God. I don't know about you, but that, that, that's my story. When I first came to Jesus 15 years ago, Coming to this church high, 
could not see. Because I could not see my condition and because I was blinded to the reality of, of Christ, I could not speak things that really made a difference. But God has opened my eyes because I can see today. He's also opened my mouth so that I can speak for him. And so Jesus just heals this man. He had set him free from the devil. And what Christ does for him physically, he wants to do for us spiritually. And so then after that, he gives this parable, urging the man to go get filled. Now, I had never experienced demon possession as, as we normally view it in my life until a few years ago, I got the chance to visit Africa. We went to the country of Tanzania. It's on the border of the, uh, of the African continent, there uh, on, on, the, on the shore, I should say, the Indian Ocean. And we were in the city called Tanga in Tanzania. We held multiple evangelistic meetings there. We were there for about a few weeks. And, and in this area, this town, the population of this town is 98% Muslim. So strong Muslim territory. And we held multiple meetings there, myself as well as others. And by the time we were finished, we had a massive baptism in the Indian Ocean and we were able to witness over 400 individuals getting baptized. It was beautiful, friends. Holy Spirit was there. And I was watching the baptism. I had a, a front row seat, and I was there with my camera taking the pictures, and, 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 and there was only three pastors doing the baptism, and so this baptism took hours to do. Tons of people all along the shore watching it, multitudes and multitudes of people coming, getting baptized, hours and hours going by, and people are just rejoicing. And I was there catching all the memories on, on, on my camera, and, 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 and there was one minister that was doing the baptism that was actually a part of our team, a Filipino pastor that joined us from uh, Southern California. Now, his name is Pastor Issachar. Now, uh, this Filipino pastor is not a typical Filipino. Because us Filipinos, were normally small and petite in stature. But, but this, this brother, he was large and in charge. I mean, he was big, he was tall, he, was, he had a deep, booming voice. And he was one of the ones doing the baptism. And I was watching what was taking place. And all of a sudden, I saw a, a very unassuming little girl, teenager, enter into the waters of baptism. She was wearing all black. She was there to get baptized. She went to Pastor Issachar, and, and, and he got her into the position to get baptized. And, and when, he, when, when he began to pray the prayer, that's when the demon manifested itself. This girl closed her eyes. Her head rolled back in a very unnatural way. And she began to flail and shout and scream, and voices started coming from her. I, I got it all on camera. I took all the pictures, and I was shocked by what I was witnessing. And, and you know, this Filipino pastor, you know, he had never experienced anything like this before in America. And so he wasn't sure what to do either. But he told me later that he actually felt, that he, he, he had her in his hands, and she, he felt that her body was actually levitating, that, 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 that she would shoot up out of the water. He didn't know what to do. And so here's what he did. He planted his feet. He tightened his grip. He finished his prayer. And then he decided to finish what he had started. With what might be the first ever slam dunk baptism. <laughs> he, he just tightened his grip. And he just slammed her in the water and baptized her. I was completely shocked. Can you imagine that? I mean, normally we don't baptize people who are struggling that much. <laughs> but God is merciful. But here's what happened, friends. When she came up out of the water, there was a great calm. And the people began to rejoice. Amen? Now, what was interesting to me, I was shocked. I'd never seen that before. Normally we don't see that here in the first world country of America. Well, as I looked upon all those Africans, they didn't bother them, not in the least. They didn't respond to it like I did because, you know, they said, you know, we're, we're used to seeing that. That's the norm. They, they always see that happening. And so to see it again, it, it wasn't a big deal for them. And friends, the reason why we don't see it much here in America is because demon possession appears in a very different form 
in first world countries. Now we do see the occasional flailing and voices and whatnot, but I believe that in our Western society, in our sophisticated society, we see demon possession in a very different form. Friends, listen carefully. I believe that, that, that demon possession appears in the forms of, of many cases of schizophrenia and other mental disorders. Now, I know that there are some imbalances in the brain, but nonetheless, friends, many of them are simply demons troubling people. Not only that, but alcoholism is a form of demon possession. Addiction to drugs uncontrollable rage, paralyzing addictions and unwarranted fear and sexual perversion, blind negativity, depression and discouragement, low self-esteem, suicidal thoughts, and even spiritual indifference in the church. These are all subtle forms of demonic possession. And it's real, friends. And some of you might protest, well, how can you say that that's demon possession? Or well, friends, think about it. Possession simply means to come in and control. We know that these things, unwarranted fear and uncontrollable rage and blind negativity and sexual perversity and, and, and low self we know that these things are not of God. It is of the devil. For the Bible says that God has not given to us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And so these things are not of God. It is of the devil. And Satan uses these things to come in, to penetrate, and to control people's lives. That's demon possession in this, in this part of the world. But here's the thing, friends. Just like in Africa, listen, listen. In Africa, they didn't really respond to the, the flailing and the voices, that type of demon possession, because they see it all the time. And in the same way here in America, we don't really take notice or respond to the uncontrollable rage and the negativity and all these things. We don't respond to that because that's the normal nowadays. Demon possession has become the norm. That's a tragedy, friends. But this man was free. God is stronger than the enemy. Satan is mighty, but God is almighty. This man had an encounter with the divine exorcist. He was made free, but the question I asked as I studied this parable, what was he free from? What kind of spirit was this spirit? Well, let's read it again. Verse 43. What kind of spirit was he set free from? Verse 43, it says, when the what kind of spirit? So it's an unclean spirit. That's the first thing we know about this spirit. Is gone of a man. He walks through dry places seeking, what is he seeking? So if you're seeking rest, that means you are restless. So catch me, friends. This man had just been freed from a spirit that was unclean and restless. And I want to submit to us this morning that those two things go together. You see, friends, it is the spirit of restlessness that many times leads to uncleanliness. Those two things go together. When we are restless, when we have no peace, it, it, it drives us to things that are unclean. And, and this is the reality of so many people today. Many people in our world today, especially young people, are consumed by media. Why? Because they're restless for visual and audible stimulation. They have to be watching or listening to something constantly. They're restless. There are others who are distracted by earthly relationships that they're not yet ready for. Why? Because they're restless for companionship. There are others who are addicted to social media. They're restless for connection and recognition. Others who are restless, uh, they're burdened by trying to live up to the expectations of others because they're restless for approval. Others who are exhausted by the busyness of life, they are restless for survival. Others who are confused by the hypocrisy that they see in the church. Why? Because they're restless for authenticity and to see someone that is genuine. Others who are contaminated by guilt and shame of their past, they're restless for forgiveness and acceptance. Others who are enslaved to the perceptions of others, we care so much about what other people think about us, we are restless for acceptance. Others who are crushed by internal securities, they want to garnish their lives. Cosmeo, which is the word cosmetics, they want to cover up the insecurities. They're restless for self-value. Others who are dis disillusioned, by the shallowness of life, they are restless for meaning and purpose. You see, friends, restlessness and uncleanliness go together. 
This was the condition of this man. Restlessness is a form of demonic possession. It is an indicator that Satan has come in and he is controlling our lives. Why is the human heart so naturally restless? Here's the reason, friends. The book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11 says that he has made all things beautiful in his time. We know that part of the verse. But the very next sentence is so profound. It says, he had made all things beautiful in, his, in its time. He has also put eternity in their hearts. Did you catch that? When God made us, he put eternity. Where? In our hearts. What does this mean? That means this. Deeply implanted within the nature of man's existence is an eternal space. A space that can only be filled by one who is eternal in nature. Eternity in every heart of every human being in the world. And that space can only be filled by, by God, the one that is eternal. The simple way to say it, friends, is this. There is a God-shaped hole in every human heart. Whether we recognize it or not, Deep down within us, friends, listen, is an inexpressible longing for something more than what the world can offer. Something more lasting and enduring, something more fulfilling and satisfying. But what happens is this, many times we ignore this longing by being busy. If the devil cannot make you bad, he will make you busy. To try to get you to ignore that emptiness. Or if we don't ignore it, we try to pacify it with the cheap pleasures of sin. But because the pleasures of sin are shallow and short-lived, it causes us to go back to that thing again and again for more and more because it's not enough. It's not lasting. And it leaves us addicts to our own desire for fulfillment. This was my life, friends. Growing up here, and why Lewin and why not? This was my life. Not knowing who God was, growing up, not really having a clue what was God or who was God. There was an emptiness within and I tried to fill it with drugs and relationships and parting and everything that the world offers. But I had to continue to do it. Why? Because listen, sin stimulates, but it does not satisfy. It stimulates you. But it will never satisfy you. Why? Because there is eternity in your heart. A God-shaped hole. An eternal space. And only God can fill it this morning. I'm reminded of what C.S. Lewis had to say. Very powerful, powerful philosopher, Christian philosopher and scholar. He said these words. Listen carefully. If I find in myself desires of which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. Did you catch that? Let me say it again. If we find in our hearts a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation for why those desires even exist, the only logical explanation is because we were not really made for this world. We were made for another world. We were made for something more than what the cheap things of this world can offer, friends. We were made, you were made for something more than the parties and the pleasures and the pursuit of gratification and stimulation. You were created for something more than just the nine to five job clocking in and clocking out in the daily routine of life. You were created for something more than just the status quo and the ordinary and the typical and the common. You were created for something more than the expectations of family and friends and society and your employers and even yourself. All of the things of this life can stimulate us, but it will never satisfy us. How do I know? Just look at the Hollywood stars who have it all and many of them commit suicide. Their marriages are terrible. They're lonely and, and they are addicts to drugs. Even the most famous basketball player in the world. Who's the most famous basketball player? Michael Jordan, of course. I, ran a, I read an article a few months ago that talked about what he's doing today. And listen, friends, in the world's eyes, Michael Jordan has it all. Fame and fortune, he has everything that money can buy. He's sitting on a billion-dollar icon. Listen, friends, you know what the icon is? Himself. 
He not just owns a billion dollar icon, he is the icon. He has a supermodel wife, mansions all over the world, private jets, respect and success. But even Michael Jordan said in this article not long ago, and I quote, he said, how can I find peace away from the game of basketball? Even Michael Jordan said, I would give anything to go back and play the game of basketball. This article went on to say that he is restless. He's restless. He has everything in this world except the most important thing. He's restless, friends. Are you restless? We will never truly be at rest until we come to Jesus. That's why life is a never-ending pursuit of rest. It never ends until you come to Jesus. Because that's why Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you will find rest unto your souls. It's not a maybe. It's a guarantee, friends. Not a lot of things in life is a guarantee, but this is guarantee, automatic. You come to Jesus, you will find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. If you have not yet come to experience that rest, don't leave this church this morning without coming. Jesus wants to give you rest. But friends, I want you to notice in that verse I just quoted. He said, come to me, take my yoke upon you. In other words, it's not enough to just lay down our burdens. We have to take up his yoke. It's not enough for us to just be emptied of evil. We must be filled with that which is good. Why? Because notice what happens in the next verse, verse 44. Notice with me, verse 44. Notice what happens. This man had been emptied of evil. He is swept clean. But the devil comes back. Verse 44, here Jesus is now quoting the demon. Verse 44, then he says, I will what? Return into my house. Into whose house? My house. Notice, friends, the, de the devil, the demon still claims us as his own. I'm going to go back to my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, notice the condition, he finds it, what? Empty, swept, and garnished. He still claims us as his house. Satan does not easily give up on his prey. He finds it empty, swept, and garnished. Let me tell you this, friends, he doesn't mind that one bit. The devil does not mind that we have been swept and cleansed and garnished as long as we're not filled, as long as we remain empty. You see, friends, let me put it, let me be practical this morning. Satan does not mind that you stop going to the clubs and the parties as long as you stay away from prayer meeting and church. The devil doesn't even mind if you go to church as long as you fall asleep or are distracted during the message. Oh, he doesn't mind that at all. He likes those in fact, Satan does not mind even if you pay attention during the sermon as long as you forget what you heard when you leave the door. In fact, he doesn't even mind if you remember what you heard as long as you are ashamed to share it with your neighbors. You see, friends, Satan does not mind if we go to a Christian or Adventist school as long as we stay away from spiritual people. He doesn't mind if you stop lying as long as you refuse to tell the truth. You see, friends, here's the point. It's not enough for us to say, I no longer go to the clubs and parties. What we need to say is, I love going into the house of God, for I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord, for in thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. That's what we need to say, amen? amen. Don't boast about what you do not do. Boast in what God is doing for you and in you. It's not enough to say, oh, I no longer eat unclean meats. What we need to say is I love eating healthfully because my body is the temple of the, of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, whatsoever I eat or drink or whatever I do, I want to do it all to the glory of God. Amen. 
It's not enough for us to say, I, I no longer gamble and waste my money on foolish things. What we need to say is I love returning my tithes and offerings to the Lord. I give because Jesus gave all for me, therefore I can never outgive my God. That's what we need to say. It's not enough for us to say, I no longer listen to worldly music. What we need to say is I enjoy spiritual songs because he has put a new song in my mouth. And one day I'm going to sing that new song on the sea of glass with palm branches of victory in my hand. That's what we need to say. That should be our testimony. Amen. It's not enough for us to say, I no longer lie. What we need to say is I'm excited about sharing the truth, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew as well as the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of Christ revealed from faith to faith, as, is, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That is what we need to say. It's not enough to say that I no longer gossip about others. What we need to say is I pray for my enemies. I love those because Christ say, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who use you and persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. That's what we need to say, friends. It's not enough for us to say, I no longer wear immodest revealing clothing. What we need to say is I'm covered with the robe of the righteousness of Christ. For he has covered me with that precious robe. It's not enough for us to say, I, I help out with, with church and I, I do the song service and I help out with evangelistic meetings and I give Bible studies and I preach. What we need to say is that I am sold out for Christ. I want to, him to use me not just one day a week, but every day and every hour and every moment of my lives to be a blessing to others. That should be our testimony. Not we, I, go to, I go to mission trips. No, friends, every trip you take is a mission trip. You take a trip to the grocery store, that's a mission trip, Amen. Because there's someone in that line that perhaps you need to share a word with, a smile with. It's not enough for us to say, I've been justified by the blood. What we need to say is that we're being sanctified by his spirit. It's not enough for us to say that I've been swept and cleansed and garnished. What we need to say is that we're being filled with his fullness. Do you get the point? You see, Christianity is not about being emptied of wrong. It's about being filled with right. The Christian religion does not consist in refraining from evil, but rather applying the mind diligently and intelligently to that which is good. Christianity is not a negative religion, but rather it's a positive religion. It's not a, a religion of various prohibitions, but it's a religion that is offering to us something better than what this world can give. It's not enough to hate evil. We must love and cherish that which is good. When you think about the, the parable of the talents, remember that one guy that got one talent? He was cast out into the darkness. Do you know why he was lost? It's not because he took his talent and sold it to buy a bottle of liquor. He didn't do that. The reason why he's lost is because he took that talent and he wrapped it in a napkin and he did absolutely nothing with it. That's why he's lost. What about... What about the fig tree? Remember the fig tree that Jesus cursed? The fig tree was cursed not because it brought forth poisonous fruit. It was cursed because it brought forth no fruit at all. It didn't have poisonous fruit. It wasn't doing wrong. It simply did not have the, 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 the true fruits, the fruits of the Spirit. It was a harmless tree, harmless but fruitless. When you look at the parable of the, the, the foolish virgin that were shut out, these foolish vir virgins were not lost because they hated the bridegroom. They were actually waiting for the bridegroom to come back. And friends, what do we call those who are waiting for the coming of the bridegroom? What do we call those people? We have a fancy word we like to use to describe those who are waiting for the second advent of the bridegroom. We call them... Adventists, these foolish virgins were Adventists. They, were, they, loved the, they, they claimed to love the bridegroom and they were waiting for him to come, but they were lost. Why? Because they had no oil. They had the lamp, but the lamp was empty. No oil, no spirit. The Bible says this, Ephesians 5, 18. And by the way, friends, I'm speaking to myself this morning. We're all in this together, amen? It's a very challenging message for all of us. God gives it because he loves us. 
wants to save us. The Bible says, and be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Do you see that? It says, don't do something, but then do something. So it's not enough to not be drunk with wine. We also must be filled with the Spirit. In Romans 12, verse 21, the Bible says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with... Friends, one of the best ways to fight against evil is simply being filled with what is good. Right? If that man, if that man's house was filled with good, there was nothing that evil could do. Don't be overcome with evil. Overcome evil by that which is good. Surround yourself with good things. There's a lot I can say this morning. Why is it so urgent and vital for us to be filled with good? Verse 45, we're almost finished. Here's what happens. The demon goes back to the house that he just came out of. He finds the condition empty, swept, and garnished. But then he does not enter in right away. The Bible says in verse 45, then he goes. He doesn't go into the man right away. He goes away. And you know what he does? He goes on a recruiting trip. He goes and he takes with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last of the man is worse than the first. Notice, friends, the demon does not come back and come in immediately. He will not risk. Here's the reason. He's not going to risk being kicked out again. He needs reinforcements. So he comes with seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And then they enter in. And this individual who was swept and cleansed and garnished is powerless to resist the total onslaught of these seven wicked spirits. And as a result, friends, as a result, he's worse than the first. I've been walking with Jesus for the past 15 years by God's grace. I've fallen many times. I've made mistakes. I am a messed up person. By the grace of God, he's picked me up. By the grace of God, I'm still going to move forward. But as I look back on the last 15 years, I can just imagine where I was right here 15 years ago. I was a young 16-year-old druggie, kneeling right here at this altar, accepting Christ. As I look back at, at the last 15 years, I've seen many casualties in this great controversy between good and evil. Many individuals Many of my own spiritual mentors, many of my own spiritual peers that have fallen away, have fallen away. Why? They were emptied of evil. They were swept clean. They were garnished by all the reforms, health reform and dress. They, they were emptied and they were swept and they're garnished, but they weren't filled. They weren't filled. And friends, just like my wife said this morning in the children's story, when your gas tank, when, the, when it hits E, there's only so much longer you can continue to go before your car dies. And as I think, as I think about all those who've fallen away, they have fallen, but I fell too. The difference is, is many have fallen, but they did not get back up. And as a result, they were bound by the power of perfect possession. A slave. And I remember in 1999, God used someone to help me find Jesus. He was a powerful preacher. An individual that I looked up to spiritually as well as physically. He was a tall brother. And I'll never forget coming to those meetings in 1999 here in this church. And the welcome, he would, he would give the welcome. And I, was, I would come early just to hear that welcome. Because he spoke with so much power. The spirit was on him. 
And, and, and when the meeting was finished, he would greet people at the, at the entrance of this door right here in the foyer. And I, I'll never forget how he shook my hand and the way he looked at me and the smile. He was a gentle giant filled with the spirit. And, and the way he shook, I look forward to that handshake. Let me tell you, friends, the greeter at the door is just as, as important as the preacher behind the pulpit. Amen. There was something about he gre- the way he greeted me, and, and, and he was a gentle giant, and, and, and he ended up becoming an evangelist, and I became his Bible worker, and, and I, would, I remember sitting at his feet, listening to his words as he, as he spoke the words of life, and I aspired to be like him. But one day, he fell, and he simply didn't get back up. He was cleansed, swept, garnished, but empty. And as a result of not getting back up when he fell, the enemy came in, and for the next 10 years of his life, a whole decade was consumed with alcohol. He was out wandering in the wilderness of the world. And I remember I lost touch with him for many years. But then I found him on MySpace. Remember that? This was days before Facebook was popular. It was MySpace. And I remember seeing his page and what I saw broke my heart. The glory of God that was on, upon his countenance was not there anymore. He was out and about, and there was a song that he played on his MySpace page, a song, and the lyrics of that, it's an acapella song that we used to love to listen to, and the lyrics of the song was, where is my father? Has he gone away? Where is my father? Does he even care? And I felt that he chose that song because perhaps he was reaching out, he was in the world, but he was restless and empty, and, and, and I, can, I, can, I can say with confidence that the devil was causing him to think that his father in heaven no longer cared. And so I remember seeing that I would fall on my knees and I would pray for him. I remember sending a message, but he never responded. Later on, he hooked up with a nice girl. She was an Adventist, but she was a really nice girl. And they ended up having a beautiful son together. I kept praying. I looked at his face in those pictures and the glow was gone and it seemed like there was no hope. But then in 2010, the Lord gave me the opportunity of coming back home here to Waianae. You remember those meetings? Four years ago, 2010, right here, uh, God brought me home. And now I was the evangelist. And now I had the team. And, and I was preaching the gospel. And, and I'll never forget the night that he came. And I saw him walk through those double doors. I saw him enter in. And, and I was so excited that I saw him. After, after about a decade, I saw he was there. He brought his girlfriend that night. And he was there. And I had a topic, but when I saw him sit, this area right here is where he sat. I remember it. The Holy Spirit came upon me, and I began to speak directly to him, but indirectly. And I began to just share, it's okay. It's okay. It doesn't matter what happened in the past. There's room at the Father's table, even for the prodigal, even for the one that has gone, on, gone away. There's room. And, I, and the Holy Spirit, I believe, used that to, to speak to him. And shortly after that, victory came. Shortly after that, he asked me to officiate his wedding. He and his girlfriend wanted to make things right in the eyes of God. They had a beautiful son together. And so what happened was they were both baptized together. The very next day, I had the privilege of marrying them. And shortly after that, he sent me a Facebook message. He had upgraded from MySpace to Facebook. He sent me a Facebook message, and, he, and these are the words that he wrote that I want to read to you. He said, I thank God every day for you, brother man. I'm glad that he sent you our way to help me. Since the seminar, that seminar that he came to, since the seminar, God has helped me overcome my drinking. I have been a real heavy drinker for about 10 years, but now I don't have a craving for it. Thank God for his strength. I humbly ask for your powerful prayers for me this Sabbath, as I now have the privilege to speak his word during the divine service. Please pray for me and our, little, our, our youth. 
Thanks again, Pastor, for your faith and for the blessing you laid upon my marriage. God bless you and your wife. Love, Daniel Williams. This man of God that God has restored. I preached here, preaching all over the island, getting invitations to the mainland to share the gospel. I love you, my brother Daniel. I praise God for what he's done in your life. He's here today, amen? This shows us, friends, that even if we have been bound by seven demons, Jesus is still stronger. Amen? That no matter how long we've been away or how far we've gone astray, God's hand is not shortened that he cannot see. His ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. And when I think about my brother Daniel and, and the ministry that he has today, I'm reminded of the words of Micah 7 verse 8 where the Bible says, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. It doesn't matter how many times you fall, friend. Just get back up. Don't stay down. Get back up. You know, sometimes, sometimes there are people who we write off as a hopeless case. But God looks at people differently than we do. You see, friends, God sees us not for who we are, but for who we can become. God hears the cry of our hearts more than the cursing of our lips. And Jesus can save to the uttermost. But how is it possible, you ask? I mean, seven spirits more wicked than himself, the number seven representing perfection, hear this man perfect, perfectly possessed by Satan. The last state, worse than the first. Well, friends, is it possible to be freed from seven demons? Is there someone in the Bible that was set free from the power of seven? Who in the Bible was freed from seven demons? Mary. Well, let me read you some of the words in Desire of Ages concerning this woman, this prostitute. This one that the religious people wanted to stone. Let me read you, friends. Listen, listen. Oh, these words are so precious. When to human eyes... Her case appears hopeless. Christ saw in Mary capabilities for good. He saw the better traits of her character. The plan of redemption has invested humanity with great possibilities. And in Mary, these possibilities were to be realized. Through his grace, she should become a partaker of the divine nature the one who had fallen and whose mind had been the habitation of demons was brought very near to the Savior in fellowship and ministry. Listen, friends, I want you to notice what Mary did. It was Mary who sat at his feet and learned of him. It was Mary who poured out upon his head the precious anointing oil and, 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 and washed and bathed his feet with her tears. It was Mary that stood beside the cross and followed him to the open sepulcher. It was Mary who was the first one to reach the tomb after the resurrection. And Mary was the first one to preach the first sermon of a risen resurrection and living Savior, this prostitute, while well, all the disciples were fearful and afraid in the upper room, this prostitute got used to talk about the resurrection. And then it says, Jesus knows the circumstances of every soul. You may be simple. You may say, you may, listen, you may say, I am sinful, very sinful. You may be but the worse you are, the more you need Jesus. He turns no weeping contrite one away, and he does not tell all that which he could reveal. God could expose us, but love covers a multitude of sins. He does not tell to any all that he might reveal, but he bids every trembling soul take courage, Freely 
He will pardon all who come to him for forgiveness and restoration. And so, my brothers and sisters, as we begin to close this morning, if you find yourself down and out, just get back up and get filled up and keep moving forward. We're almost home. Why is it important for us to be filled? Emptied is not enough. It's not enough to just stop doing wrong. We must be filled with Christ. Empty is not enough. Why? Because the devil is coming after you. He's not going to give up on you. The devil has a trap laid for you. But the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But the question this morning is, is he in you? Is he really in you? You're in church. But is he in you? The question is, not if you've been emptied of evil. Don't boast in that. The question is, have you been filled with Christ? And so here's what happened. My last verse. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 3. Here's what happens, friends. You know what the problem with Laodicea is? The problem with the church of Laodicea is that they have been emptied swept and garnished. But there's someone on the outside that wants to come in and fail. Revelation 3, verse 20. Here Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. You see, Jesus wants to come in and have a meal with us. It's called the bread of life. And when we let Jesus come in and have that meal, we're going to be satisfied. We're going to be filled. No more shall we be restless. And so he comes and knocks. Not only does he knock, but he calls us by name. Oh, friend, do you hear him calling your name this morning? He's calling you. No matter how long you've been away, no matter how far you've gone, he is calling you right now. He's knocking and he wants to come in. And friends, here's the thing. When we open the door of our lives and let Jesus Christ come in the hope of glory, here's what happens. The devil, that demon, comes back with those seven wicked spirits. He knocks on the door, fully intending to control the house. He has his reinforcements. So he comes back with his reinforcements, all these seven wicked spirits, and he knocks at the door of our heart, and then all we need to do is we need to say, Jesus, Jesus, would you please answer the door? Would you please get this one? And Jesus will answer that door. And when Satan looks in, he sees Christ. And you know what he has to do? Sorry, I have the wrong house. <laughs> and he has to flee. Because the Bible says, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of God shall lift up a standard against him. Now here's the thing. Many of us have opened the door to Jesus, but we've allowed him to only come into the living room of our life. We don't want him to come into the bedroom. Things in there we don't want him to see. Yes, Lord, you can come and visit in my living room, but don't go to my kitchen. But Jesus must permeate every room of our house. Because if he's just in the living room, the devil might be able to slip in through the bedroom window. This morning, he wants to come into the bedroom, the place of intimacy. He wants to come into the closets of our life to clean up all the garbage and all the things that we've been holding on for so long. Let Jesus come and clean out your closets, folks. Let him come and permeate every single room of your house. So the question is, did Jesus get in? I close with this story. I said before, you know, I only see you once a year and so... I have to preach three, three sermons in one city. <laughs> but don't worry, we're almost finished. Or we're almost there. But listen to this story as Jackie comes and gets ready to sing the closing song. 
The story is told about a young man that grew up in the church. And growing up in the church, he was protected by many of the sinful ways of the world. But this young man was never truly converted to Christ. He went through the motions and had all the head knowledge. But as for that heart encounter, that heart experience, it, it, he never came to that point. And, and so he was protected from the ways of the world. But when he became an adult, he actually became a very successful businessman. But he became too busy for God. Too busy for church. And though he did not have time for church and time for God, he comforted himself. He patted himself on the back that, that he was a good person. You know, he never really did anything wrong. I mean, he lived a fairly clean life. But deep down inside, there was a void. There was a, there's something missing. You see, his problem was that he was emptied and cleansed and garnished, but he wasn't filled. And when his wife announced that she was pregnant, this soon-to-be dad was so happy, so happy. I mean, this father-to-be uh, wanted to give his, his son that was to come into this world the best advantages in life, the best of education, the best opportunities, the best life experience. And, but this father never saw church as something vital to his development and growth. And so he thought to himself, when he is older, I'll let him choose for himself. One day, this little boy was about six years old. This was the pride and joy of this dad. And when he was about six years old, this father decided to take him to an art museum. It was going to be father-son time and a very cultural experience. And, 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 and this little boy was excited to experience something new. And the father felt good being able to explain all the different paintings in this art museum to his son, just teaching him. And, and all of a sudden, as they're making their way through this art museum, they, 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 they see this big painting on the wall of Jesus knocking at the door. And the little boy stopped and he looked at that painting and he, it just caught his attention. And he said to dad, daddy, who's that? Daddy, who's that? But when he asked that question, the father was gently convicted that his own son did not know about the Jesus that he grew up learning about. And so he had to explain, well, well, that's Jesus. Who's Jesus? Who's Jesus? Well, son, you know, many people believe he's God, the creator, the one that gives life. The son thought about that. Then he asked the next question. Why is he knocking on the door? Why is he knocking on the door? And the father had to explain what it meant. And he said that, you know, son, this, this painting represents how, how God is knocking at the door of our lives because he wants to come in. He thought about that. And this little boy, you know, young minds, they're just so inquisitive, right? Always asking questions. Drive you crazy. This son asked the next question, well, if he's God, why doesn't he just go in? Well, he, reflect, he respects our freedom of choice. He will never force himself into our lives. He thought about it. Then he asked the next question, well, why don't they open the door? When he asked that question, the father's conviction grows deeper. Because he's realizing that through these questions, through his own son, that Jesus is knocking at the door of his heart. And he had to say, well, well, maybe they don't hear him knocking, son. Why not? Maybe the television is too loud. Maybe they're occupied with other things. Maybe they're just too busy. And the father began to walk away to the other painting. Conviction was strong. He wanted to get away from it, and, and he walked away, but his son did not follow him. His son stood right there, fixated on this painting. He wouldn't move, and all of a sudden, the father looks back, and he sees tears running down the little face of his boy. Tears. And he goes back, son, why are you crying? What's wrong? Why are you sad? And here's what the boy said. Daddy, I was thinking about what you said about Jesus knocking at the door. And I started thinking about you, Daddy. I love you, Daddy. I know you're a very busy person. Daddy, I love you so much, but Daddy, has Jesus knocked at your door? Oh, the conviction is so strong now. 
Well, son, yes. He knocks at all of our doors. And the last question. Did he get in? Did he get in? Did he get in? That's the question I leave you this morning, my family. You're in church, but did Jesus get in? You bring your little ones to Sabbath school, but did Jesus get in? You're a good person. You're not doing anything wrong, but did Jesus get in? You pay your tithes, give your offerings. You sing the songs, you preach the sermons, but did Jesus get in? Or is there something still blocking the blessed Christ from coming in? Our prayer this morning, hover over me, Holy Spirit. Bathe my trembling heart and brow. Fill me with your hallowed presence. Come, oh come, and fill me now. I am weakness, full of weakness. At thy sacred feet I bow. Blessed, divine, eternal spirit, come, oh come, and fill me now. Cleanse and comfort. Bless and save me. Bathe, oh bathe my heart and brow. Thou art comforting and saving. Thou art sweetly filling now. I want to make a special invitation this morning. As we do, I want to invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Listen to the words of this song. And let Jesus get in your heart today. Listen carefully. are bowed and as your eyes are closed many of you have let Jesus in already he lives in your heart today you're already filled and you're already free if that's you I invite you to reaffirm your decision in your heart and remain seated as we make this special appeal for three types of people sitting in this church today I want to make an invitation for you to come to the front for a special prayer. For the first person who has been dominated by demons and this morning you want to be free. Satan has come in and he's controlling a part or a portion of your life and you're tired of being bound. You want the chains broken. You want to be free. That's the first person. The second type of person may be those who have already been free. You have been released from evil. You've been swept. You've been cleansed, but you are still empty. And, and you're, you're free, but you're not filled. And this morning, you want to be more than free. You want to be filled with Christ. You want Jesus to come into the every room of your house, not just the living room, but the closet, the kitchen, every aspect of your life you are free but you're not filled and this morning you want to be filled listen friends these are those who you're not doing anything wrong maybe you have a real experience with God you've even given up some things but you now understand that it's not about not doing wrong it's about being filled with he who is right and this morning you want to be filled that's the second type of person then the third those who are free those who are filled but you want to take it a step further 
and you want to overflow. You're free and you're filled, but now you want to overflow. You want to be, make yourself more available to be used by God. You want to be a, a wellspring, an overflowing fountain to be a blessing to others. And this is a commitment perhaps for individuals whom God is calling into a full-time ministry. Or maybe individuals whom God is calling to go to a Bible college to be trained. Or maybe individuals who just want to be more involved in this local church. Maybe you want to make yourself available in giving Bible studies or being a brighter light in the context of your work and community. You are free, you are filled, but now you want to say, Lord, I want to be overflowing. That's the third person. Again, many of you have already let Jesus in your heart. Many of you sitting here are already free. You're already filled. You're already overflowing. If that's you, praise God, remain in your seats. But if you fall into one of those three categories, you are a slave and you want to be free. You are emptied and you want to be filled. Or you're filled but you want to overflow. I want to invite you to come right now for a special prayer. And kneel down at this spiritual altar. As Jackie sings, come. Father, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting us to come as we are. Some of us have come to you this morning bound by the enemy, slaves to bad habits, addictions, pride, selfishness. But Lord, we believe that you can free us. We believe that you are stronger than the enemy. And so would you come, dear Lord, and make us free? Would you come and break the chains that are holding us back? Would you come and free us from evil? We want to be free, dear Lord. Hear the cry of our hearts. And we claim the promise you said that when we know the truth, the truth shall make us free, and when we are free, we will be free indeed. So bless those who have come with freedom today. Others have come because they are already free, but they're not fully filled. We're not doing anything wrong. We're, we're fairly good people. We have a good heart, but yet it's an empty heart because you're not there. Lord, this morning, fill us with your presence. We open our heart, Lord, please stop knocking, just come in. We don't know how to live our lives. We don't know how to gain the victory, but, but all we can do is choose. And so this morning we choose to let you come in and to work your miracle of transformation in our lives. Please, dear God, come into the living room, the kitchen, the bedroom, even the closets. Would you please permeate every room of our lives? Lord, we understand that we have no power over the seven demons. You're the one that has the power, so please fill us with that power today. We want to be filled. Lord, we also want to overflow. And so there are some who are convicted this morning that they need to be more involved. They need to make more time in their weekly schedule for, for, for evangelism, for witnessing, for Christ. They need to, they need to be, speak out more and, and pray for opportunities, giving Bible studies. Others, you are calling to ministry. Others need to go to Bible colleges. Lord, you speak to those. Give them wisdom to know what you're calling them to do. I pray that you would make them an overflowing fountain of blessing. For the rest of us, Lord, just save us, dear God, is our prayer. Thank you for the mercy. Thank you for your patience. 
Bless us now as we get off our knees, as we leave this place. May these words burn in our hearts forever. Thank you, dear God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.